Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Perry Marshall. Uh, and the way I got connected is through Be- Perry's book, Detox, Declutter, Dominate, How to Excel by Elimination. And I couldn't be more excited to learn about how one might detox and especially declutter their lives. I think many of us now are in Zoom hell. So uh, this message of decluttering really seemed to resonate. Um, yeah, tell us to begin with, you know, the, the, the genesis for this for this book, Perry. Well, the um, well, I just I just want to preface by saying uh, I think we could all agree that right now the distraction factor, okay, and the interruption factor, and the drag you away from whatever you're doing right now and go watch BBC, CNN, et cetera, et cetera, factor. Exactly right like, now cranked up to 11 or maybe 12 or 13 right now. And like, you know, I know you got a very international audience, but like I was in the UK a year and a half ago. And on that particular week, there was nothing in the news except Brexit, 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 Brexit. Right. And like, there's all this stuff that is just raining down on people. And um, and, and, and our brains are wired in such a way to get stimulated and like, oh, well, gee, you know, if I get an argument with somebody, it makes me feel like I'm doing something about this. And right. And, 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 the, and the truth is most of us can't do anything about 99% of that stuff. Okay. And so people are feeling like, so like wrung out like a dish rag. Okay. So I guess that's just kind of the preface. The story behind this book is about five years ago. Um, it was a winter day, kind of like today. And um, I was talking on my phone in my office and I got these French doors. And suddenly the president of my company, this is my home office. The president of my company who lives 500 miles away is on the other side of the French doors and I'm unannounced <laughs> and I'm like, what's he doing here? Gee, do you think this is good? I don't know. So I get off the phone. I'm like, Brian, Perry, what's up? We need to, t-. and he sounds very undertakerish. We need to talk about our cash flow, Perry. Okay. And um, and he's like, we have, we have too many expenses, not enough revenue, too many projects, too many employees, too much this, too much that. Perry, we need to cut. We need to chop. And we, so this is like two o'clock in the afternoon. We argued about this till probably 11 at night. And yeah, basically I won. Like, Brian, you know, you don't understand like, how cool this new promotion is going to be, how cool this new project is. You know, we got the stuff in the oven. It's just about to burst out. Well, about three months later, none of that stuff had really materialized the way it has supposed to. And like, now I get now I have a real problem, (laughs) you know, like, well, we don't really need to put out that little brush fire. And then, and then it turns into a real fire. And now I had a real fire in my And in fact, um, now I don't know about you, maybe this is kind of unique to my company. We don't do our Christmas party um, in, at Christmas because Christmas is way too busy. We do our company Christmas party in April. I think that's a way better time to have a company. We're having our company Christmas party. And normally, ah, we'll have a State of the Union speech and talk for 45 minutes and then we'll just screw around the whole rest of the day. Everybody, you know, come comes in. Well, that that day, it's like we had this like three hour meeting about like, well, how are we going to fix this and how are we going to fix that and how are we going to make this cash show up? And it was really like not even a fun Christmas party. And and that was basically when I realized like, dude, you better start doing what Brian told you to do. And so, and I did. And I I had waited too long, and it was not fun. And I spent the entire summer cutting, chiseling, chopping, cuddling, chiseling, chopping, right? And trying not to amputate anything and trying, you know, to cut fat and not muscle and bone. 
And I did not, 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 not enjoy it. But we finally get through it. And, you know, I, we, we probably laid off 30 or 40% of our staff. And you have to understand like, okay, yeah, I'm a best-selling author and like all this other stuff. But if, if, if you have too much staff and you have too much overhead, it doesn't matter what else you got going for you. It doesn't matter, right? And, and then, you know, you lay people off. You're not done paying them. You're still writing checks, but they're, they're, not, they're not in the ship rowing anymore. It was awful. But I got to the end of that, and it was like, wow, this ship is a lot lighter, and it's got a whole lot less barnacles. And, and then something else happened in the middle of this that kind of crystallized the whole thing. I was visiting a friend of mine who was working for the summer on an island in Western Ireland in the, in the, in the coffee shop. They had this little... Hostel is a gorgeous, gorgeous island called Great Blasket Island. And Jerry was working there for the summer. And Jerry is, she's like this older Irish mystic woman. Uh, she's the kind of woman that reads poetry and stuff, very into nature, not a techno person at all. And she tells me about this argument that these people are having. And the husband's like, look at this place. There's birds and there's seals and it's so green. It's like, have you ever been in such a beautiful place? And his wife is like, get me out of here right now. There's nothing to buy. There's no stores. There's no shops. We're standing in this long line waiting for mediocre coffee and tea. Get like, she was freaking out, right? And she's like on her phone and she's on Facebook and she's scrolling. And Jerry's like, Perry, people are so like wound up in their technology. Like they can't even, she holds up her hand. She didn't have a phone. She's holding her, her hand like it's a phone, right? She's like, people are so like tied up in this stuff. They can't even have a conversation with another human being. She goes, Perry, this is not good. Now, when she said this is not good, you know what she meant? She meant, she meant what we've seen over the last four or five years is going to happen is what she meant. You know, the polarization, like everybody's, everybody's like reduced to pixels and everybody's reduced to sound bites and headlines and political orientations and nobody can get this is what she was talking about. And, and I got it. She goes like, we got to do something about this. And I, it was like, just in an instant, I realized I've, I've got to teach people how to subtract because I've spent the entire summer subtracting. Now, what was the problem with my business? Here's the problem with my business. I thought the solution to everything was to add another thing. And, 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 and the lady that came to, to the most beautiful island in the world and can't see the green and can't see the birds and can't see the seals, she's added so much barnacles to her life that she's not even human anymore. And so that, that's really the story behind this book. Wow. Yeah. And that, yeah. And I said, but that 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 image actually of being surrounded by beauty, and I've been to Western Ireland, and it is it is green, and it is Astonishing. stunningly beautiful. Yeah, and to think you could find yourself there in a cabin and still be staring at that little screen. Yeah, well, you know, the cell phone towers still work three miles off the shore, right? And so you can be completely entangled in all of that stuff, no matter where you are, right? Yeah. And you're right. And it is toxic. I mean, it's toxic. Of course, it's this extraordinary informational device that, you know, in, in our hands, we've never had anything like it in human history. We've got access to the extraordinary amounts of information, right? And, and yet it is at some level so toxic for us. We're just not, somehow not adapted to, to deal with something as compelling almost, right? It's, it, 
Yes, and and so it's it's not it's not about being a ludite. Like I'm not suggesting that somebody just throw away their cell phone and live on an island. I'm not suggesting that, but we have to manage the technology, and it has to be managed from a place of space instead of a, a space of clutter. Okay, and the space starts here. Okay. Like there's lots of books on Amazon about decluttering and they're about like straightening out your kitchen. This is not a book about straightening out your kitchen at all. God bless you if you want to go do that. This is about straightening out your inner space. And, and, and see when, and so I started subtracting and it began with subtracting like, well, you know, I got this employee and I don't actually need them. Now, once I really looked at it and figured it out, uh, we can rearrange things. I don't need this expense. I don't need this product line. I don't need this project. I, I could I not even do it and, and the company would be more profitable. But then I got to, you know what? Delete the social media app off your phone. You know what? Start your day with prayer and meditation and not CNN and not scrolling through any news feed or any, any feed of any kind, start like, start with space. And that, it is extraordinarily productive and it's calming and it's healthy. It's good for your health. I, you'll live longer. You'll be less likely to get cancer. And so, and so this is a method. This is a like a step-by-step, -step, this is how you do it. And this is how you orient your entire career, your professional, your business around subtraction. Right. And, and that was the, that was the, that was the insight, right? This is what I've been doing. And this is, I've been doing this and this is what I need to teach the world. Yeah. And it sounds to me like that, well, you call it in the book Ren Renaissance time, right? Yes. And that, and I did that. So, so, it, so I just want to talk. I just want to because because I think lots of people may have that aspiration of yes, you know, maybe they're going to listen to this podcast. And be, yeah, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up half an hour early, and I'm going to do that meditation. And I certainly I have had that aspiration so many times that I've maybe kept it up for a day or two, and then life intervenes. Like, what? Yeah, what have you found as help to you know around that? To, you know to have that be a sort of permanent fixture of your, of your life. Okay. The, the funny thing is, is that if you start by subtracting, you don't even have to get up earlier. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. Hey, if, if you, if you want to get up a half an hour early and pray and meditate, I am all for it. But what people don't realize is how much unnecessary clutter they have in their lives. Like, I'm really serious about deleting the social media app off your phone. So when I came home from that trip, I actually created a program that we call 30 Day Reboot. And in the program, we said, all right, 30 days, we are, we are going to, we are going to detox your life. We're going to declutter your life. And the very first day we said, you are going to delete the social the Facebook app off your phone, the Instagram off your phone, whatever, Twitter, whatever. You don't need that. You think you do. You don't. You can do Facebook or social media 30 minutes a day after five o'clock PM, but you can't, and you're just going to agree with the other members of the group. I'm not going to do all that stuff. Oh my word. People didn't know they were spending two hours in little snatches, they're in the restroom, they're in their lunch break, they're waiting for a page to load, and, you know, and they pull out their phone and like, and they get all entangled with this. And what they don't realize is that their, their brain just gets cluttered and their emotions get spinning on, oh, they're, it's, it's, it's Donald Trump or it's Boris or it's Brexit or it's the election or it's, it's whatever somebody's arguing about, right? And, and, and pretty soon, you, all of your, your heart and your soul and your energy is all getting consumed in that. So we're like, all right, we're going to delete that. 
we're gonna we're gonna unsubscribe from like tons of email lists and like and this was just like the first day or two and then we subtract more we subtract more and like okay so instead of starting your day by reacting we're going to start your day with space like you get out of the shower you go and you get your cup of coffee and you sit down with a notebook and, you, and there is no news feed, and there is no texting, and there is no email. And you have the luxury, you have the permission, and you have the luxury. Like, just trust me on this. You're going to do this for 20 minutes. And you get to do it. It's not like you don't have to do this. You get to do it. You get to start your day with the luxury of sipping your tea and thinking about what do I want to do today? What am I thankful for from yesterday? What are the questions that are on my mind that I don't have answers for right now? What is really important? What one thing, if I get this one thing done today, I could justify taking the rest of the day off? There's almost always a good answer to that. Usually it seems out of reach. Well, okay, to be honest with you, if we got client X and they signed out of the dotted line, yeah, the whole department can take the afternoon off as far as I'm concerned, right? There's, those things are always always there. And, 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 and you, you get to ask yourself those questions. And, and it is so much better now. When the pandemic hit last year, not only so I had my own set of problems, well, I've got a live event with 100 people signed up and they're coming, except they're not coming anymore. So how do I prevent like, oh, I don't know, $200,000 of refunds. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Okay. It's like I had problems, but I'm a consultant. I got clients. I've got, I've got thousands of customers. All of a sudden, they're like, ah, what do we do? Every kind of business you can imagine, in every industry you can imagine. I got people in the trade show industry. There's no more trade shows. I got people in travel industry. There's no more travel. What do, what am I, I going to do? And so, so now, you're, you know, here we are. What? Can't believe it. Ten months later, the number one answer that people have given me when I say what has been the best source of sanity in the last year has been, the answer has been Renaissance time. Right. How do you deal with the pandemic? You turn off CNN, you get your cup of coffee in your notebook and, you know, God, the head office, however you want to think about it, you're just going to ask for wisdom and you're going to be in that space. That's how you deal with a pandemic. That's how you deal with an economic crisis. Right. Yeah. And what I like about your answer there is because, because often I fall in, I do fall into that trap of what do I need to add? I need to add meditation or I need to add yoga or I need to add the walk around the block, you know, and we often hear that, don't we? This is what I need to add to my schedule. And I think it makes so much sense to start before that, to start with, right. What are all the things that are hijacking me? What because because it's actually just just the act of sitting down requires a clear mind to begin with, right? It's it's not the sitting down that necessarily clears your mind. You need some level of calm in your mind to be able to feel like you've got that ability to do it. Because if you're like all in, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do this, and you've been sort of ramped up, as you say, by a bunch of social media feed you're less likely to take that step in the first place to feel sufficiently calm to allow yourself to take that, to take that time. Yeah. If, if so in, in, in this book, detox, declare, dominate, I've got a chart of like, these are $10 an hour tasks and then these are hundred dollar an hour. And then these things earn a thousand dollars an hour. Here's a list of things that earn $10,000 an hour. Now, if, and the $10 an hour stuff is like driving to the office depot and picking up pencils or, you know, like silly stuff like that. Right. And, and, and the $1,000 an hour stuff is like strategic, you know, making strategic changes in your business. And, and, and here's the thing is, is you get more 
$10 an hour stuff done by speeding up. But you get more $1,000 an hour stuff done by slowing down. $1,000 an hour work, and it exists. I mean, we can go into that if you want, Richard. There's, there's, there are absolutely, in your life, in your schedule, there are $1,000 an hour tasks. There are 10,000, like if you do this, even for three minutes, you just earn $10,000 an hour for three minutes. Okay. That those are, there's little bits of that all over the place. Those do not, you do not get more of those done by working faster. And, and so, and so I call it slowing down to speed up. It's very important. Um, and and see if you if you design your life so that you delegate the ten dollar an hour task, you avoid the ten dollar an hour tasks, and you are consciously aware of the thousand dollar an hour stuff, and you deliberately make space for it. Pretty soon, you're living in a whole different reality than most people, and you actually make more money. You get more done not less right well let's well let's actually sort of translate that because if you're working a regular job you know it may be difficult to put the pieces together there well how i've got to fix that how, how am i going to make ten thousand? yeah so help help people with that well so let's start with an example of a person with a job so let's say we're talking about helen who's the receptionist at a dental office Okay, and Helen makes, well, you're British, 15 pounds an hour. She makes 30,000 pounds a year, right? And she thinks of her time as being worth 15 an hour. And her idea of a raise is going to 16 or 17, right? And in that job, maybe she would never make more than 20, right? But let's look at her job from a different point of view. The phone rings. Woodlake Dental, can you hold, please? And she puts somebody on hold. Now, you got a person, they were, they were getting ready to spend 5000 on some dental work. And two minutes later, um, thank you for holding. Can I help you? And they hung up. Okay, she just lost... 5,000 pounds in two minutes. Yeah, that's 150,000 pounds an hour that she lost. So a 15 pound an hour person lost 150,000 pounds an hour in two minutes. So my contention is if she and the office manager and the dentist and whoever else in the office, if they all sit down and they figure out how are we going to make absolutely sure that nobody who's ready to spend 5,000 on a bunch of crowns and dental work ever gets put on hold for two minutes, whatever meetings, whatever structure, whatever systems they have to build to make sure that never happens, that is thousand pound an hour work. And it moves the dental office ahead because Helen thinks of her time as being worth 15 an hour. But in actually, in actual reality, her time is worth nothing like half the time. And then her time is extremely valuable for these little spikes of critical things that are going on in that business. And that's 80-20 thinking. Because everything in the world is 80-20. 80% of the value comes from 20% of the time, 20% of the effort, 20% of the people, 20% of the products, 20% of the customers. And so if you, if you can focus on the hot spots and realize that most of the rest of it is relevant, you tend to sweep a lot of the relevant stuff off the table and not even have it, and you just make space. And now it's easier to focus on the important stuff. And so that's what detox, declutter, dominate is really all about. Right. And going back to Helen in that example, 
how does she avoid just going up like a couple of extra you know pounds an hour if she is the leader that transforms the organization in that way of course she's not going to be on 30 for 30k for very long oh heavens yes look look in the see when when people like when people apply for jobs um, I mean, I remember, you know, 30, 25 or 30 years ago when I was like, just, you know, fill out a job application and it goes into this slot. I don't have the slightest idea of what's going on on the other side of that counter. Okay. Inside that business. Well, what's really going on inside that business is you have somebody who's in charge. Okay. In a small company, it's the owner, the founder, the founder's wife, you know, the, that kind of stuff. And in a big company, you know, it might be the managing director or whatever, but you have somebody, they have to get crap done. And they are surrounded by people who do not feel particularly urgent or convicted or anything else. They don't really get it, right? But that managing director, that go-to guy, that founder, that owner, like stuff, ha like the product has to ship. Okay. And when you, I don't care if it's a receptionist or a mail clerk or an errand boy or a dishwasher, when you have somebody that shows up and they, they stick their head up and they look around, and they're like, Hey, those phones aren't getting answered. I'm going to make sure those phones get answered. There's no way that managing director or owner is not going to notice. And there is always a short supply. I, mean, I don't care what the unemployment rate is. I don't care what the economy is doing. There is always not enough people who make sure stuff actually gets done, make sure product actually gets shipped, make sure phone actually gets answered. Okay, so yeah, she was hired as a $15 an hour person, but she's going to make $45 an hour when they figure out how good she is. And she's not going to be the receptionist anymore. She's going to be the office manager or, or what have you. This is how the world works. Yeah. And it all starts with that analysis of like, what's the 80, 20, where, 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 where am I adding a thousand bucks now? Or if whatever if it might you be. understand 80, 20, you can start in a restaurant as a dishwasher. And if you're looking around and you're paying attention and you're listening to the conversations and you're paying, where are the stressors? And where is the balls getting dropped? You won't be a dishwasher for long. You just have to understand 80 to 20. Right. And from your personal experience, Perry, I'd, I'd be interested in what, what's been the biggest breakthrough for you and your business in applying 80 to 20? Well, so... I am remorseless and relentless about shrinking the time in which I am available to do stuff because you're like, well, I used to be able to, available eight hours a day, now six, and then it's five, and then it's four. It's like, okay, I so like I'll give you an example. Most days my day starts at 11 30, like my do stuff get busy like action part of the day it doesn't start until 11 30. 11 30 is when i go through emails with my personal assistant that means from when i get up until 11 30 that time is cordoned off and only available for very important proactive projects not reacting to crisis and it's like, see, most people, they do stuff that makes them feel busy because busy, like busy is good. Like, oh, just look busy. Just like, well, we're paying you $15 an hour. So look busy. This is how most people do their work. Well, looking busy has nothing to do with productivity. In fact, at least 20% of what most people are doing is literally counterproductive. It's making them less money. It's getting less done. It's moving it all backwards, not forwards. Literally true. And, 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 and so you, you start looking at that and, well, what does this actually produce? And see, again, if, 
if you're on a fixed salary or fixed hourly wage or whatever, it's not particularly obvious how this is going to help you. But just trust me, if you if you start focusing on that those 8020s, you'll become one of the most valuable people in the company. And when you ask for a raise, you're going to get one. Yeah. And if they don't give you one, somebody else is going to hire you. <laughs> right. No, and and it's 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 the mindset that's most important, right? It, it, not the immediate return on it is what I'm getting here. It's it's yes. inculcating that way of thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You go. What? So eighty twenty. So eighty twenty says eighty percent of what happens comes from twenty percent of what you do. But there's an eight. There's an eighty twenty inside the eighty twenty. I call it eighty twenty squared. Eighty percent of the eighty percent comes from twenty percent of the twenty percent. You know what that means is two thirds of your productivity comes from 5% of what you do. Okay, two thirds of the money you made last year came from, okay, if you, if you work, what, 250 days a year, what's 5%? Half, half of what you produced last year, you produced in two weeks. Now, it might have been a day here, a day there, an hour here, an hour there. But if we bunched up the really productive parts of last year, most of what you got out of last year, you produced in less than two weeks. All right. Okay. And, and this is true for everybody. Now, a salesperson on street commission will see this very clearly. They'll be like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right. It was this meeting, this meeting, and this meeting. And that was like two thirds of the year right there. Yep. But see, it's also true for Helen. It's like, well, like last year, there was like a hundred phone calls and they paid most of the bills for that dental office. And Helen answered them right. And that's why the dental office is still there. This yeah. is how everything is. Yeah. So there's tiny little hinges that swing big doors. But I see where this ties together to Renaissance time because one, well, A, you use the Renaissance time to get a handle on that. And then secondly, that goal setting or that reflection is like, what am I going to do today? Like, what's the one big thing I'll get done? Well, that better be in the 20% or even better in the 20 of the 20, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, you know, everybody says life is short. No, actually life is long. Like, I don't know how we're all going to live. I'm 51. You know, most people are going to live in the either 60s or 70s. There, that's a lot of life. That's a lot of time. I think when, when people say life is short, what they really mean is we all treated it like it was wasteable. And we wasted it. And that made life seem short. You, you can do a lot if you're focused on what's important. You know, and, and so, so you, were, you were asking me, you know, how, how has this impacted me? Well, okay, so my, like, clocking in every day starts at 1130. But my most productive time happens before that. This is why... I am able to run, I mean, I'm basically running about six or seven companies right now. And uh, I put out three books last year. And okay, like it's possible to be incredibly productive when, when you apply this. Wow, right. It reminds me a little bit, I don't know if you've ever done that reading of Charles Darwin and his, and his journals or his diaries. Have you come across that? Well, that's, a, I could, Tell me more, because that's like, I could go down that rabbit hole very far. Right. Oh. Well, I, I'm not going to get this perfect, right? But my recollection of it is, you know, it's something like, you know, I get up at eight, you know, I, I take a leisurely breakfast, you know, maybe, you know, spend a bit of time with the kids. And then I, and then I take a walk from like 9.30 till 11. And then yeah. maybe I'll do a bit of work. And then maybe I'll have lunch. And then perhaps I'll do a little bit more work after lunch. Then I'll have a nap. Uh, you know, then it's time for my, my evening meal and then I enjoy the evening. 
<laughs> yes. Charles Star, you know, and one, of the most, one of the most productive people, you know, humans in history, right? Yes. Okay. And and see, so that's great. That's perfect because Charles Darwin understood, I think, for a living. Now, Helen doesn't think that she thinks for a living. She thinks that she sits at a desk for a living. Okay. But see, so if 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 you're just punching the clock, most punch the clock stuff is $10 an hour. Okay, maybe it's 20. Okay, maybe it's 30. But it's like it's it's on the low end of the spectrum. Okay. If you understand that I think for a living, like, okay, I'm a software programmer. My my job is not first to be typing at the keyboard. My first job is to be thinking about how this program is architected, about how the information flows, about what's the pri what what does the client want, what is what does the user want, what are we actually trying to do here? Like Charles Darwin. Like a good a good software developer is not a guy who's just hunched over banging on chiclet little keys all all the ch -ch 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 -ch. Okay, that it's, it's somebody who stands back and says, what are we trying to do here? A good software developer should be more like Charles Darwin. Tell you what, why don't I go walk around that little sandwalk trail around my house? I've been there. I've been to Downhouse. In fact, I shot a little documentary last year, which is going to be released. That's like a whole other conversation. But walk around the sand walk. And when I come back, maybe I will have figured out a different way to approach that subroutine. And you slow down to speed up. Like, hey, wait a minute. We just figured out how to not have to write 4,000 lines of code. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Um... And it, and it a lot of this starts with that courage to just let go of those. So there are addictions, right? We're addicted to, to social. We're addicted to busyness. You know. To, yes. To yes. Like that. In fact, that's exact. That's exactly it. It's breaking the addiction and forming a more healthy addiction. I'm addicted to Renaissance time. I have not missed a day in seven and a half years. No. Oh, Every wow. day. Okay. Now, th this this is why I'm so productive. I mean, it's funny you mentioned Charles Darwin. I, I created the largest science prize in the world. It's the Evolution 2.0 prize. It's a, it's a $10 million prize for where did the genetic code come from? I've got a book called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design. Darwin had time to think about stuff. Darwin had time to ask questions. He was very good at asking questions. In fact, the biggest problem with Darwin is the people that came after him were not as good at asking questions as he would, as he was, and they turned his theory into like um, a dystopia. But that's like a whole other conversation. Like I think Darwin himself was um, was was a, was a, was a gentleman, and he was very. You know, one thing about Charles Darwin, if you if you read what he, he wrote, he was always very provisional and very, he was like, you know what, I think this might be right. But, you know, this could be wrong, this could be wrong, this could be wrong. He was not dogmatic. Now, I think he would roll in his grave if he knew um, how dogmatic the people that came after him were. And, and, and they became very un, un, uncivil. But he himself, he was a genius. And the, but the, point, the point to this conversation is that you need time to think so you can think for a living because all the breakthroughs are gonna come from thinking, not spinning the hamster wheel faster. Right. Yeah, and, 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 I, and thinking is, Thinking is an activity which isn't necessarily exciting, right? And I think that, that that's when I think about it. Because when I look at my own news addiction, you know, social addictions, and I inquire into it, it, it is that excitement, right? It's the, 
you know, it's, it's the excitement that I have to let go of. And that's the work I'm doing right now on some of this is to let go of that, yeah, that addiction to the excitement and, and thinking may occasionally bring exciting moments when we feel like we have a breakthrough. But for a lot of the time, it's, it doesn't provide a lot of excitement. I, I wonder if that's part of this. Well, so, so it's, it's hard. Thinking is hard work. I mean, it just is. And it doesn't look like work to other people. So like if, if you adopt the mindset that I'm talking about today, like your, your spouse and your family is going to need to understand what you're doing. Like, okay, dad's in his cave from 7.30 to 8. Don't bother him. Yeah, I know he could be pouring cereal and he could be helping with the kids, but dad needs that space. Now, I've trained everybody around me to understand and they, they realize like Perry needs, he needs to go do his thing because like that's, that's why fruit falls out of the tree when we shake it is because like husband, dad, like, he, like he's, he, he's doing that stuff. And so it's, it's a totally different thing. And I, I have these, this conversation quite often with clients. They're like, my wife thinks I'm wasting time when I'm out on the back deck, sipping a drink, steering into space. Like, well, well, first, you just need to know in your own heart, this is exactly what you need to be doing. And you need to defend your space to do that. And over time, the others around you will recognize, hey, he's in his zone, he's in his groove, she's doing like, that's her magic space, leave her alone. Right, right. Yeah, I, I can see that. And also there could be, I mean, I wonder as well if there's a, almost a certain, you know, jealousy, like, uh, you know, how- Of course. Yeah. Of how, course. Who are you? <laughs> who yeah, thinks that you can- like, Well, I think for a living. Right. I, I figure out how to how to write the software program with 40% less lines of code. Yeah. Right. Because I think everybody everybody wants to jump into it right away. Okay, we got the assignment. Here we go. Like, no, no, wait, we're gonna stand back. We're gonna plan this thing. We're gonna architect this thing. We're gonna ask questions. We'll start it, we'll start this next week. We're gonna map it out first. I'm gonna think about this. I'm going to ask, well, why do you even need that feature in the first place? Like, hey, wait a minute. And like, oh, yeah, well, actually, we don't need that. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> we just saved six weeks of, you know, labor. Right? This applies to anybody. Yeah. Like, I, I would, I, I am certain that just about everybody, 10% of what you're doing at least you should not be doing it at all. And the minute you stop doing it, you'll make more money and be more profitable and have less to do. Just stop. Like what project are you working on? You just shouldn't be doing. Why is anybody doing this anyway? Yeah. All the time. Yeah. The other, this, this also resonates with me in terms of a pattern, uh, in terms of my own emotional work and healing work, right? Mm. So in, in that in that mode, I'm not um, I'm not building. I'm not necessarily thinking. It's not proactive, but it well, it is a proactive in a sense. But it is providing me space to heal and process emotions and work on where I've been triggered by people and what's going on and delving into the history to heal over time. And I found that get, in a similar way, actually protecting that space for for, for me to heal has produced a similar reaction in others. Like, what do you, what do you think you could just sort of lie around and cry for two hours a day? Like, what, 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 mm. I don't understand it. But from a therapeutic perspective, a healing perspective, in a longer term, it's brought, you know, huge benefits for my emotional stability and mental health. I am glad you brought this up because I've been through that too. Okay, about, about 10 years ago, I was in a big midlife funk and, and I, 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 did, I just sort through a lot of garbage, okay? And, and one of the things that, how, how should I put this? You know, there's, there's no such thing as like accelerated speed healing. 
<laughs> right. Okay. Like, you know, if, if, if you get your finger open, there's certainly things you can do to help matters. There's better ways to deal with the cut finger than others for sure. Okay. But you know, there, there's, there's no way that like, there's no 10 minute and it's all better. Okay. It's a process and, it, and, and it's got to take time. And yes, you know, there, there's a proverb in the Bible, guard your heart for from it flow the wellsprings of life. Okay, and, and part of Renaissance time is like, I get this space where nobody else gets to take their machete or their ice pick and like, like vandalize my inner world. Okay, like this is my room. This is not your room. It's, it's, this is like my mental bedroom. And I'm in, I want the lamp to be over here and I want the desk to be over there. And I want the bed to be over. And I want this picture on the wall. I, I get to arrange my inner space. And when my inner world is right, then I can go work on the outer world. But I'm going to work on the inner world first. And that, that's what, Richard, that's what you're talking about. That's exactly it. Right? And, and, yeah. and if you're emotionally healthy, you can do good work. Yeah. If you're not emotionally healthy, okay, I'll, I'll tell you somebody who wasn't emotionally healthy, Steve Jobs. Enormous, enormously productive and artistic, but demons out the wazoo, and you read his, bi or his biography, and you know it. You know what? I do not think it was necessary for Steve Jobs to be an asshole in order to accomplish what he accomplished. So I'm glad he was an accomplished person, but those people had to put up with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other, the other parallel we can make here is I think what's good for the individual too is it's good for the team. And I see this in teams all the time that I work with. Again, they, they don't make that space to be together as a team in a reflective conversation you know be it about building proactively or be it about healing and sort of working through whatever team tensions exist i think i think it's as important to create you know the equivalent of renaissance time for for a team yes yes so um boy i i, I hope people really take this seriously because this this is the foundation of everything else i mean we haven't even gotten into all the Yeah, this is step one and step two, basically, but it's, it's probably worth the, the focus on it, right? Oh, absolutely it is. Because if, if you get this right, you have a foundation for everything else in your life, being able to build on a solid foundation. And look, I think, I think we can accomplish way more. And we actually do it by doing less, not by doing more. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and so you, you don't have to run in a hamster wheel for the rest of your life. It's not, you're not destined to that. It's not necessary. Right. Right. Okay. Well, we've got, we've just, we've just got sort of five minutes left of our time together. And yeah, as, as we've just said, we've really focused in on, on steps one and two that I wonder if you could just give a flavor of the, the rest of the manifesto, if you like, for those who want to uh, you know, go get the book or, or check you out in more depth. Yeah. So let me, I'll just, spend a couple of minutes on step four, create an irresistible product that's a joy to use by simplifying. Now, every great breakthrough in anything is a simplification, okay? And, and so I, I'm gonna use the Google search engine as example. I want everybody to think back 20 years and remember back in the days of Yahoo, Hotbot, Lycos, Alta Vista, like the early days of the internet before Google was the big search engine. And what was the difference? All of these other search engines, they had all this stuff all over the place, right? It's like this headline and this ad going by and this is blinking and, you know, there's all these The links. weather report, right? Okay. And Google is like the world's weirdest websites. Like there's a completely white page with a little box in the middle right? And there's a search and there's an I'm feeling lucky, right? And now what, what was that? Well, it was absolutely genius for a bunch of reasons. And there's, there's a story. Um, 
of Larry and Sergey, the founders of Google, um, they're like in Morocco at a cyber cafe that probably has a 28K modem or something. And they go there and they're like, okay, so let's type google.com and let's see how long does it take for the, the site to come up, right? And, and we're timing it on our stopwatch, right? And then, and then we search something on Google and then we time on our stopwatch, how long does it take to the result to come back? And they were absolutely anal about making sure that was like lickety split, like even on a slow, you know, we're in Africa in some hideous place, it's still fast, okay? Now, but, but then furthermore, think of what they did. They bring you all the world's information from a white page with a search box. I mean, it's one of the most complex tasks ever devised by man is to organize all the world's information and you get it down to just type anything you want in this box and hit enter. Okay, that is what, okay, I don't care who you are, I don't care if you're Helen at the dentist office or if you're a software programmer or you're a um, managing director of a healthcare company or if you run a nonprofit, your job is to take something really complex and make it as simple as a Google search page. And if you do that, you will have a breakthrough. In every great company, that is what they did. It's what Uber did, it's what Apple did, it's what Airbnb did, it's what, like you just go down the list. And it's what a good department manager does, it's, it's what a good dishwasher does, it's simplified. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you see that without, you talked of, you mentioned Apple, right? You could see perhaps that commitment to simplification has uh, been shaken a bit because the damn notch, right, on the latest iPhone, it seems like sacrilege uh, that, uh, you know, we've, we've lost that simplicity of the, of right. the main screen, right? Right. So the, the world belongs to the simplifiers. Yeah. Okay, well, there's more, which uh, we'll leave. We'll leave people for, for to get the book uh, to catch the rest. The rest of uh, the ideas there uh, associated with uh, detox, declutter, and dominate, of course, and, and succeed. So, yeah, it's been a wonderful conversation, Perry. I I thank you for your time. I thank you for taking the effort to read the book, to write the book, should I say? Um, Richard, thank yeah. you for having me on your show. It's an honor, and uh, I really I wish your listeners a fantastic New Year. Right. And in terms of where to go, uh, yeah, to get more of this information. What just, just go to Amazon and buy Detox, Declutter, Dominate. It's a 36-page book, by the way. Uh, that's a yeah. whole nother story. We chiseled cool. this. It, it was it was a 150-page book a year ago. And my co-author said, no, Perry, uh, it's it's an 8,000-word book. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's easy to read. It's short. It, it will really revolutionize your life. Yeah, absolutely. You're walking your talk with a book. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, once again. Uh, and uh, yeah, I do encourage you all to get, get the book. Uh, and thank you, Perry. Thank you, Richard. Have a great day. Thanks.